Good morning. Good morning and welcome as always to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Welcome to this one part of Christ's body in this world. Welcome to those members that make up Christ's body. Might we be encouraged here? Might we be strengthened? Might we may be made just uncomfortable enough to continue and do God's work in this world? We celebrate here this Sunday, the very last Sunday of the liturgical year, uh, because next week we will find ourselves in Advent. I know much of the world has been celebrating Christmas for at least three months now, but for us, for us, Advent starts next week. Advent, this time of, of preparation, this time of readying ourselves for the incarnation that will surely be upon us, that incarnation which will save this world. So might we prepare ourselves, but first might we celebrate this Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, where we might set aside, oh, our hubris, our ideas of grandeur, and that we might rely on the Christ and the Christ alone. There is so much that is going on as this is a busy season of the church. I would invite you to take a look at the, uh, your bulletin. If you're joining us online, you could find your bulletin at firstchristianniles.org. We invite you to take a look at that and see some of the things that we have going on this week. Uh, we do have a board meeting following worship. Uh, if you wish to join in on that, uh, you're more than welcome to. There's a Zoom link that's been published uh, in the praises and prayers and updates uh, in the email that went out through the week. Um, or you can just stick around. We'll go right into our board meeting following service. And uh, we also have our uh, youth-only luncheon following service. So there is something for everybody following service this week. We're not going to have any Bible study this Wednesday because we will uh, shift from what we've been doing into an Advent-focused uh, uh, infancy narrative study that will begin next week. Since we're going to start a new Bible study session next week, I want to know what would interest you to, to join in. Um, just as a, a very quick overview, would, would you be more interested in coming if we had something in the afternoon or if we had something in the evening? Okay, we got two folks for evening. Um, is there a day of the week that works better for anybody? Would Wednesday evening work for anybody? If we did a, a Bible study at Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m., would there be interest in folks to attend? Good enough for me. All right, we are going to have our <laughs> Bible studies throughout Advent. We'll do Wednesdays at 6 p.m. We'll try and aim for an hour. If that time doesn't work for you, no worries, because we'll still make sure uh, to have this available for Zoom, and we'll record the session so that we can then publish it on Facebook and YouTube. So you can join in no matter what. Uh, but we will uh, be live then and in person Wednesdays uh, at the church at 6 p.m., starting not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Uh, of course, this Thursday is Thanksgiving, uh, which means Friday our office will be closed, but we invite you to come in Saturday for our Hanging of the Greens. Uh, we'll begin that at 9 a.m., and uh, we are also utilizing this Saturday, this uh, Hanging of the Greens opportunity, as an opportunity to do uh, some general cleanup in the church. So we would invite anybody that wants to come. Uh, if you see something that needs a little bit of extra love within our building, we invite you to come on Saturday and, and put your, uh, your stewardship, your time, and your talents into, into beautifying this building. Uh, or we could put you to work in decorating the sanctuary and, and putting together all the, the fun things that, that make uh, this Advent season uh, special to us. You uh, can see a few of the other announcements that we have in the bulletin. I'd invite you to take a look at uh, that at your leisure, uh, probably after the service. But uh, we also then uh, would invite you, let me bring up these real quick. Uh, to consider our Thanksgiving special offering. You can see the insert in your bulletin uh, this morning. This is one of our general ministries uh, that goes to support uh, through the general structure of the church, of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the United States and Canada. This is a special offering that goes to benefit uh, higher education, institutions of higher education that are connected to the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. This is an opportunity for us to um, place effort and intentionality around the development of making mature disciples, around foundation, uh, which we talked about so much during our stewardship focus. 
And as we did just come from our stewardship focus, um, I, I, we had said that uh, Stewardship Sunday would be last week and it would be the opportunity for everybody to turn in a, uh, uh, a, a card um, saying what you were going to be committing yourself to for the, uh, for the next year. It's still not too late. Uh, we do have uh, a few folks that normally give a pledge card that have not yet, um, so we would invite you to partake in that if you feel called. And uh, really, the challenge we had this year was that everybody would turn in a pledge card, even with just your prayer life, with what it is that you commit to pray for the church. Uh, we still got a lot of those cards left, if you wish, to let me know what your prayer life would be or that we are committing together uh, for the next year in the ways that we will serve Niles First Christian Church and through this church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. With all this being said, oh, there's still uh, opportunity as well. Uh, we put out last week in the Narthex a uh, directory update card. This directory update card, we're encouraging everyone to fill out so that you can give us your information so that we can up update the directory uh, with up-to-date information. This uh, directory card also has an opportunity for us to fill out what our skills are, what our, our gifts are that we might be able to serve the church better, that we might even put together uh, a gifts directory so that if you have a specific need in your life, you can rely on the individual gifts of those members in this congregation uh, to supply those needs. If you need an electrician or a lawyer or, uh, or, or something, we have those skills in this congregation. And it should be good for us to rely on one another. The only way we can do that is to have that information readily available for members. So I invite you, encourage you, that as you leave uh, this morning, that you take one of those cards, fill it out, and make sure to get it back to Carolyn in the office so that we can have that available for our members. All that being said, let us set our sights beyond ourselves. May we focus not on what we wish for ourselves this morning, but how Christ is moving through and with us. In this day and all days that we recognize the, the solemnity of our Lord, that we recognize that we are ultimately not in charge, but that Christ is our ruler, that Christ is our King. Might we place our hopes on the divine that is in our midst this morning. Lord of love, we give thanks that we belong to your kingdom, which is higher and greater than any human power. Every child and elder, every neighbor and foreigner finds a home in your kingdom of peace. Jesus said, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Give us ears to hear the voice of Christ, our King, above the din of human voices. Settle the dust and become stirred up inside us by debate or division. Give us eyes to see your will and ears to hear your word, so that we may love one another, love ourselves, and love you with all that we are. In your holy name we pray. Amen. May we join together in our opening hymn, Give Thanks.
May we join together in an attitude of prayer. First of silence, personal prayer, naming oh, that, which, what, that which we give thanks for this morning. Those things that God has blessed us with. And those things that lie heavy on our hearts. That we might bring them to God who surely knows. But in our prayer that we might be moved into difference of attitude. Into difference of action. I then invite you to hear the morning prayer and to join together in the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. ever-present God. You who have existed before there was and will exist after whatever this is ceases. You of all times and all places. You who have chosen to dwell with your creation to be truly ever-present with us. We give thanks that you show your presence with us in, in mighty wind and still quiet breath. We give thanks that you make your presence known to us as we pray and as we sing and as we sit by ourselves. For we know that nowhere we can go will ever be far apart from you. In you, we hope in your presence and in your assurance of salvation, we hope. And indeed, in this hope, we are saved. Though we know you are present with us, we don't see you. For who hopes for what is seen? Yet, in your presence, we develop in patience. We grow as disciples. In your presence, and with the grace of your Spirit, you grow with us in our weakness. And when we can't find the words, and when we fall short of your grace and glory, we know that your Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. So again, search our hearts. See that we wish the best for each other, and in this divided time, though we might not understand each other and though we might not listen, we still hope for you to come into this world again. To break down the barriers that we have created. To show yourself ruler over our human systems. Our failures to lead. Our brokenness as we vie for power and prestige and wealth. Show us again as we move into this Advent season what it is that we wait for and that we hope for. Show us the power of your incarnation as shown through your Son. Show us that in a manger resides the King of all. Might our lives be changed with this truth that though we might be conquerors through you, the power that comes as a conqueror is to be wielded as your Son has wielded power. To serve. To humble ourselves. To seek what is good for all people. Remind us in this season which has so many different directions tugging at us. In this busy season where we forget to sit and be still with you, O oh God. Show us again. Remind us 
And when our minds are too busy or when we think we have the answers, break into our stubbornness again and show us a better way. Might we, as we approach this holy season, focus on you alone and the story of how your Son created salvation through brokenness, brought us hope by dying on a cross, and showed us how to live with an empty tomb. God be with us. Emmanuel, God be with us. And might we pray to you in the way that your Son, in whom we find salvation, has prayed to you. Might we join in one voice as we pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us then to hear our scripture reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 8, verses 24 through 39. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, all, he, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold His own Son, but gave Him up for all of us, will He not with Him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who then is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God add a blessing to this in every reading of God's holy word. Might we join together again in prayer. God be with us. We know that you are, O oh God, for nothing can separate us from you. Despite even sometimes our own best attempts, we know that you reside with us, that you dwell and saturate in this creation, and that we are with you always. Might we be aware of your presence again, guiding us beyond what we are able to guide ourselves to. Indeed, grow us as individuals, as a community. Call us again to live righteous lives so that all that we say and do and think 
towards you and towards all creation and towards each other be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in elementary school, my absolutely favorite TV show was the Teenage Newtons Ninja Turtles. When I went through our Seaborn Elementary School thing, um, the Halloween parade, I dressed up as Leonardo. No, no, I was Donatello. Because Donatello was, was the smart one, and that's the one I wanted to be. And I convinced my parents that uh, that I needed this costume, the Teenage Newton Ninja Turtle costume, and my dad kept correcting me, saying, that's not what they're called. And believe me, I had seen every episode of the Teenage Newton Ninja Turtles, so no one was going to tell me that I was wrong about the name. I watched it every chance I could. I knew the entire theme song by heart. I knew what they were called. And yet my parents, with patience and perse perseverance, tried to explain to me time and time again, it's mutant. Newton's not a word, Chris. Well, sure it was, because that's what they're called. No, no. It's mutant. Please, just let, let's read this together. Let's figure it out. Some years later, I, I conceded that I was wrong. I'm also the type of person that uh, learns vocabulary words by reading books. When you read a book and you learn a new vocabulary word, you don't always know how it's pronounced. So me learning these new vocabulary words would try and use them in conversation. And I remember when there was, there was one instance and there was this loud sound and it echoed and I said, boy, that really reverberated. And whoever I was talking to kind of looked at me. It what? Then it reverberated. It made that it made that bouncy sound that echoes. You're close. The word is reverberate. I looked at it written down again. I went, oh, I could see that. Yeah. But it made me start to wonder, and it's something that I carry close to my chest all the time. I wonder what else I'm wrong about. No one knows that they're wrong, right? No one ever knows that they're wrong about something because as soon as you are shown that you're wrong, you choose what's right. But what are we wrong about that no one's ever corrected us about? What are we wrong about that we've just never been in a situation that we could grow through that? I tried to do a study, actually, to, to figure out what the average American is wrong about, and <laughs> no study exists. How would you even make a study that tried to figure out what everybody is wrong about? Because everybody's wrong about everything now if you listen to the news. Everybody's wrong except for the speaker. Isn't that the way it works right now? Subjective truth, everybody is wrong except me. What else are we wrong about? As someone that speaks publicly, weakly, as someone that is, that is meant to be a, a, a spiritual leader within a congregation, I wonder and worry and mock about what I might be wrong about. A good example was just a couple weeks ago when I said no city was ever, would ever want to be named Sodom. We got one in our county, y'all. I had some loving people correct me. Lovingly, thank you. Which I appreciate. What are we wrong about? Are we ever going to be right enough that we can be viewed as righteous? Are we ever going to be right about enough things that we can be on par with God? That will, will we ever be right enough about things that will ever be good enough for God? These are things I worry about. But I see throughout Scripture reminders that we're not called to know everything. In this world, we see that we only see through a mirror dim. We don't see an accurate reflection of what creation is. We see through our eyes, through our own experience. We f see all that is only through our limited selves. 
It is the nature of our limited knowledge and vision and wisdom that we can never know the breadth and width of all that there is. We should stop trying to pretend that we know everything. Because in that is some form of liberation. We never have to be the top authority on everything, which is something that everyone seems to try and do today. Everybody is an epidemiologist right now. With the news that came out a couple days ago, everybody's a lawyer. We're all experts about everything because of just a little bit of good. We all fall into this. I myself fall into this. But today is a good reminder that we don't need to. It is not up to us to know everything. Because we never can. We see in Proverbs 3, 2, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. There is a liberation in trusting in God over ourselves. I'm reminded again of, of Paul's words to the church in Corinth in chapter 2 when he says, I know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Paul, who wrote to every single church as frequently as he could, telling them how to be church better, one of the most profound things he said to anybody was, I don't know. All I know is Christ and Him crucified. What is the nature of our wisdom and our knowledge that we try so hard to be experts in everything and yet we must admit how little we actually know? And I find that the more that I learn, the more I realize how little I actually know. The more you study the world, you realize how much there is. The more you study the universe, the more you realize just how small of a part of it you are. Now some of us, that would lead into some existential crisis, but for me, as a follower of the king above kings, I find solace in it. I find a joy and a hope that the world doesn't rely on me. Thank God. Thank God it is not up. As well, we'd be in a heap of trouble. It's not up to me, and it's not up to you, but to God, who I think is just about the only one who can fix things. We hear in our scripture reading today that our hope is not that we might be knowledgeable, that we might know everything, but that we are predestined. And in being predestined by a God who knows all and sees all and has existed before time was and will exist after time has ceased. The one who sees creation from the outside and knows what we will choose every step of the way. That God knew what we would do. And in that predestined nature that we find ourselves in, we have found ourselves called. And in being called to live as faithful people, we find justification, not through our own deeds or through our own knowledge or anything that we do, but through Christ, the King. And in this justification, we are glorified. This is the will and the work of our Lord. Now that doesn't mean to rest on your laurels or to stop working because what we, because God does all the work for us. We rely on our works to show that we are faithful, as we should. But we shouldn't put false hope that my work or your work individually will save this world. In God that we have hope. And in these things, we are conquerors. We are more than conquerors. I love this line. I, I, I've used, I, I dwell on this. This is a, this is a passage of scripture that I, that I meditate on. Uh, there's, there's power in this, in this passage. That we are more than conquerors. What does it mean to be a conqueror? If you are just a conqueror, you subdue. You use force. Military might to show your power. But we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through the God that knew what we would do and has called us and justified us and glorified us. It's through these actions of the divine that we find ourselves being more than conquerors. 
more than just those who use force, more than just those who seek military advantage, more than just those who seek to have power over others. We have it. We are conquerors because of God's work, but we're more than conquerors. And I had to figure out what that meant for a while. And what I've come to is that Jesus was a conqueror. Jesus is the king. The king of all kings. King above all kings. Ruler of the universe. And yet, up until the crucifixion, no one quite thought how Jesus was a conqueror. They expected him to overturn the military rule of the Romans, to crack the empire, to be the next Elijah who came in with an army and with force. They expected him to be a run-of-the-mill human conqueror. But his actions took everyone by surprise. For he went willingly to a cross so that we might find what it means to be conquered. That we might conquer this world as Christ has conquered it. As Christ has subdued the powers of human beings by showing us grace and mercy. What does it mean to be right by saying, I don't know? What does it mean to be knowledgeable in our ignorance? mean to be powerful by giving up power. This is what Christ has done for us. Shown us a new paradigm of how to live. How to be better than this broken systems that surround us. We are conquerors as Christ is a conqueror. Because we are more than conquerors. Marcus Borg, the theologian, says it this way. The point is not that Jesus was a good guy who accepted it, and thus we should do the same, although that would be good. Rather, his teachings and behavior reflect an alternate social vision. Jesus was not talking about how to be good and how to behave within the framework of a domination system. He was a critic of the domination system himself. When he saw empires trying to rule the world, Jesus looked to Isaiah when a time where a lion would lay down with a lamb, where swords would be beaten into plowshares, it makes sense that Jesus took this route. Because what does violence beget but more violence? What does bloodshed beget but more bloodshed? That our systems are broken because they've been created by us. Which is why I really don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, a capitalist or a socialist, whatever language you put behind yourself of what human system you follow, that's all it is. It's a human system. And it will be broken. We follow one who is above all this, who is king of all. We celebrate today as Reign of Christ Sunday. The actual name of it is the Solemnity of Our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. That's a little too much for you. We can call it Christ the King Sunday or Christ the Cosmic Ruler Sunday. It is the last Sunday of the liturgical year and it reminds us as we prepare for this Advent season, as we get our lives and our minds right to focus on what the Incarnation actually means for us, that our hope doesn't reside in the broken system. Our hope doesn't reside on what we know, our wisdom, or our knowledge, and thank God for that. Our hope resides in the one that is above us and yet chooses to be with us. Man, God with us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. How good is it that we are called here to 
to sit in the presence of the divine with us. How good is it that at this table we recognize that we are justified and glorified because of what Christ has done. How good is it that at this table we are reminded that we are not in charge, nor could we in any way that matters. The one that we serve at this table, the one that has called us to break bread together, to live with each other in harmony so far as we are able, has called us to be with God's self. This table is set for us, that we might be reminded every time we gather with one another of what true power looks like and what it means to serve. So I hand on to you the way that it has been handed on to me. But on the night that Jesus last ate with friends and with family, Loaf of bread and after having blessed, broke. Saying, This is my body broken. Whenever you eat it, eat it, remember. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after having blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of it. And as often as we have an opportunity to gather together, to eat together, to break bread together, to share a cup, we are reminded. It is not us in charge. How should it ever be? We follow the one that has set the table. And we will proclaim that we serve crucified Christ. Will he come to us? So I invite you to take that bread that you have with you. And partake as Christ's body broken. Take that cup again, or that symbol of the cup that you have with you. That symbol of a new covenant of which we are reminded and of which we set ourselves firmly again to partake of that cup of Christ's blood. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come together to share in this communion, we're reminded of the words of Jesus when he asked that when we share in this bread and this cup, we remember him. We remember his teachings, his ministry, his life, and his death. We remember that during his life and at his death, he was thinking of us. I pray that we never forget those words and the significance they hold for us today and of all of our tomorrows. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength be unto you, our God, forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, amen. May we join together in our closing. Let all things now live.
all members, first and foremost, of the realm of God. May our lives reflect our citizenship, and our actions reflect the Christ, who lives and reigns, one God, now and Go out today to tell others that they are loved and cared for by our love.